going to now introduce uh, John Mankins, who uh, will be the chair of theme one. We have four themes in this um, meeting, and uh, John is going to set the stage uh, in uh, considering how to enable large-scale space development and human expansion. John is a uh, renowned uh, person in the uh, space world. Um, I've known him uh, closely for 26 years, and uh, he's provided the brains for a lot of things that I've accomplished. <laughs> and, um, the, um, uh, uh, he, he's now uh, vice president of uh, the board for Moon Village Association and is a member of the board of the National Space Society and also Space Canada, which is why Space Canada is one of our sponsors now. He's formerly Chief Technologist for Human Exploration and Development of Space at NASA Headquarters, and his 25 years at NASA uh, and at Jet Propulsion Lab ranged from flight projects and space mission operations to systems level innovation and technology management. He, his um, uh, program with roughly $5 billion budget uh, accomplished that, and he is recognized as the leading expert in the field of space solar power, which is sometimes abbreviated SSP. And he's the author of The Case for Solar Power in 2014. It's a book this thick that uh, really lays the whole thing out in a way that's uh, believable and understandable. He created NASA's Integrated Technology Readiness and Risk ass Assessment Methodology for Managing Advanced Technology Projects. Mankins has BS and MS degrees in physics and an MBA in public policy analysis. His numerous honors include NASA Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal and the National Space Society Space Pioneer Award. He, cha he chaired the International Space Development Con Conference uh, in 2018, which had the highest attendance, more than 1,200 people, and the highest revenues of any International Space Development Con Congress in the past in the whole 30 years of its existence. And he lives on his family ranch in the central coast of California near Pismo Beach, which is a beautiful place. You should visit it sometime. John. Good morning. Uh, it is truly uh, a pleasure and an honor to follow such distinguished uh, keynote speakers this morning. Uh, I find myself uh, in the odd position of uh, having put onto my charts uh, basically all the things that they've already said, <laughs> uh, which I think uh, just uh, in, suggests that it, it really might be time if people can come from uh, such disparate uh, initial points of view and arrive at essentially the same conclusion. So uh, for my own uh, uh, personal introduction, I'll just say that I, I also was inspired uh, when quite young uh, by the uh, U.S. space program and by the exploits of John Glenn and Alan Shepard, and I aspired to nothing more than to, to end up being an astronaut myself. However, when I discovered uh, at the age of 11, uh, my, my father was out, uh, we were, we were, he was taking me out to learn uh, to uh, hunt deer. And he said, uh, do you see that deer on that hillside over there, you know, next to that tree? And I said, what deer, what hill, <laughs> what tree? <laughs> so then, then we went and discovered that I was in fact blind as a bat. And, and that took care of any aspirations to become an astronaut. Uh, and hence, hence I ended up, despite my, my reluctance for mathematics, uh, becoming a physicist. Um, so, so what is, what is the vision, uh, that, uh, we would like to see happen? Now, this is, uh, my initial version of that, and it's, uh, has to do with the human exploration, development, and settlement of space. Um, obviously, uh, one of the things that I, I would personally include in that vision is the idea of U.S. leadership. Uh, not just uh, uh, leadership in space, but also global leadership. I think that that is a fundamentally uh, benign and good thing for the world, and it would be a tragedy if it were to fade. Uh, and therefore, we should, I think, do everything we can 
to assure that it continues. And leadership on the earth for the last uh, 60 years has meant leadership in aerospace and space technologies. Uh, I think that it is necessary to undertake uh, ambitious missions in space and that the undertaking of such ambitious missions will engender the creation of highly profitable new markets uh, for the U.S. Uh, commercial sector. However, those things, ambitious missions and leadership, are not going to happen using uh, system concepts and technologies uh, from decades ago. Uh, if you look at the pace of change in terrestrial technology and terrestrial infrastructure, and uh, I imagine that pretty much everyone in the room uh, either has one of these things with them uh, or it's a, it's a uh, mobile telephone, it happens to be an iPhone, uh, or has one uh, at their house or in their bag or somewhere. Uh, think about the difference 20 years has made in terrestrial consumer electronics and the pace of evolution and change in these technologies and then compare that to what we have not achieved in terms of a comparable pace of advancement and change and development in space. 20 years ago, 1998, we were getting ready to have the first launch of the first pieces of the International Space Station. And 20 years before that, 1978, the solar arrays which are on the space station we're sitting at the technology level in research labs in places like Cleveland at the what was then the Lewis Research Center. And 20 years ago, this was unimaginable. If you look at a movie, the best way you can tell what the era is for the movie uh, is to look at what kind of mobile devices do they use or not use. If you've seen uh, Pretty, Pretty Woman, the movie with uh, the Richard Gere and, and Julia Roberts, it's quite remarkable that he actually has a mobile phone. It's this massive thing about the size of a shoe. And so um, robust, affordable systems and robust and affordable operations are crucial to making a revolution happen. Moreover, one of the things that we've talked about for decades is uh, flags and footprint type missions and exploration activities. And I think one of the most, most, one of the most uh, substantial transformations in our thinking more recently is that we have actually begun thinking not about sending a person to Mars and returning them safely to the Earth, but rather about going and staying, rather about uh, extending human presence and activity into space more or less permanently. Uh, and that starts with the moon uh, as uh, the, uh, the key stepping stone to realizing all of that. Uh, one of the reasons why this could actually be done uh, is uh, because the universe is on our side. Uh, Kraft Ericke uh, once said, uh, tongue in cheek, that if God had intended for humanity to become a spacefaring species, uh, then he would have given the Earth a moon. <laughs> if you look, this is a this particular diagram uh, is a uh, is of the uh, the the depth in uh, kilometers, uh, the equivalent potential energy depth in kilometers of the Earth versus uh, low Earth orbit versus uh, other places in our solar system. And uh, if you think about the moon as the uh, sort of the, uh, the initial way station and the place where we reach out to, it is, it's clear because it is near the top of our gravity well and is uh, uh, sort of by comparison, you, I'm sure everyone has derived for themselves the rocket equation, but it's an expo exponential equation. And in the, in the exponent, there, is, there are several key terms. One of those is the, the delta V, the change in energy that you have to go through. So it's not just a simple linear thing, it's a, in fact, it's an exponent. And so the delta V to go from the Earth's surface to space is about 9,500 meters per second. Um, the delta V to go from the moon to space 
is about uh, 1,800 meters per second. And if you compare in size the Saturn V rocket to the upper stage of the lunar excursion module, so one is about the size of a Volkswagen van of the 1960s, and the other is the size of the Empire State Building, you get a sense for how important that difference in delta V can be. Well, as it happens, uh, uh, Kraft Ericke was, uh, uh, of course, being facetious, but we are fortunate in that we do, in fact, have a moon, and it is the, um, it is the place from which we can go forward. So continuing now for just a moment on the idea of the vision, uh, I want to just speak to it for a few moments about what kinds of things we need to pursue and what kind of things we need to realize, uh, starting with the moon, so advanced human exploration development and settlement systems. So for example, uh, modular systems uh, that are intelligent. This is, you know, sending humans out into space will not happen by them. We will not go by ourselves. We will go with literally thousands upon thousands of intelligent modular systems going with us, not to mention tens of thousands of other species and, and living organisms as well. But part of the vision of HEADS human exploration, development, and settlement, is that we are not going to just go to the lunar surface and sit in a can. We're not going to just go to Mars someday and sit in a can under buried under regolith. We have to, in fact, be planning to explore and to ultimately understand and to utilize vast regions of the moon and ultimately of other solar system bodies. Is Joel Sircell here yet? Not yet. Okay, so he, he'll be coming in, I'm sure. Joel Tercel will be speaking about this this afternoon as well, the other bodies. Uh, we have to be able to have access, uh, again, with these modular systems to large portions of the lunar surface. We're not, there's no point in going to the moon if it's just to sit in one spot and return to it. And uh, sort of like a, the, the, the virtue with the space station is, uh, although it's, it's described as being in low Earth orbit, that's not a pinpoint, that's not a, uh, a marker, a, a dot on a map that, in fact, it covers a great majority of the globe in every day's orbit. So it's, it's actually a, an entire region of space. Similarly, we have to be able to access large portions of the lunar surface. One of the th discoveries of the last 20 years, which is really profound in lunar science, is the discovery uh, and the validation of these uh, permanently shadowed cold traps in the lunar polar regions, and the existence of, um, of ices and other volatiles that have been trapped uh, over the course of uh, eons in these cold traps and are now there and proven to be there in great abundance. And the, I, I remember very clearly when I started at uh, NASA JPL and, and, uh, and I was quite interested in the moon, it was an article of faith. It was a known fact that the moon was drier than the crypts of Egypt, that it had no moisture, it had never had moisture, and get over it. And, and any thought to the contrary, for example, in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, uh, Heinlein's wonderful novel of the 1960s, that there might be caves of ice on the moon, that's just nonsense. Everybody knew it wasn't true. Well, of course, in the last 20 years, now everybody knows exactly the opposite. Uh, that there are, in fact, uh, great uh, resources available, both water and, we hope, ices. Well, how do you develop those resources? Uh, this, this particular illustration just shows the idea of, um, of putting uh, uh, wireless power transmitters up on the rim, uh, the permanently illuminated rim of one of these permanently shadowed regions, so that the energy can be beamed down to those little dots of light where you have uh, rovers down there wandering around, powered remotely, uh, extracting uh, uh, water and other volatiles from the uh, lunar regolith. This kind of development of the resources of the moon that we now know are there is the reason why in the next year or so, maybe about 18 months, uh, China will be sending a lander and a rover to explore one of these uh, regions, these permanently shadowed regions. It's the reason why there are multiple missions going from China, Japan, India, all going to the moon over the next six or seven years to explore, find these resources, understand them better, and to be in, begin to plan for their development and their utilization for the benefit of those space programs. 
And I wish I could say that there, I could give you the date when the, the U.S. landers are going to be arriving and when the rovers are going to be going out, but I can't give you that right now because the program is in reformulation. But a year ago, there were no plans at all. So I give all, all credit to Administrator Bridenstine to actually be turning the ship in the direction of, of uh, beginning the search for and the development of uh, uh, lunar resources. Uh, I put this up partially tongue-in-cheek only because now there's a great deal of um, discussion about the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway, which is a sort of a keystone part of NASA's uh, lunar program. Uh, this is actually a concept uh, for a modular uh, Earth uh, lunar orbiting platform that I developed back uh, 20 years ago uh, uh, with, the ex with the expectation that uh, this kind of thing was going to be quite important not just uh, for, the, uh, for access to the moon, but also for uh, caching supplies and materials that are brought up from the coal traps and so on. And this kind of outpost, <coughs> not just in lunar orbit or at the, L the libration points between the Earth and the moon, uh, but also at Mars and elsewhere in the solar system, these kinds of outposts are going to be quite crucial uh, to human expansion into these regions. So, development of lunar resources, the creation of uh, actual settlements on the moon, equally uh, important elements of the emerging uh, vision of what we can do at the moon. Uh, I mentioned another international example. Uh, you may find, if you've looked online, you will have seen uh, <coughs> China's plans for a, um, a palace of light or a, 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 a solar palace uh, on the lunar surface. So looking forward and planning for a, uh, a large-scale permanent uh, presence on the moon in the next several decades. And of course, if you advance these kinds of systems and capabilities, <coughs> they will be equally valuable elsewhere. Uh, um, in particular, transforming operations in Earth orbit, uh, enabling the development of exceptionally large uh, telescope systems far beyond the Jim Webb Space Telescope uh, to allow the remote exploration of our universe, uh, the development of these advanced uh, propulsion systems um, that are going to be one of the topics of uh, this uh, particular meeting, uh, allowing us to go in a timely way both to uh, destinations where people might go as well as uh, to send probes out uh, into the, uh, the uh, nearby galaxy, the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt objects, of course. Um, and I used these pictures rather deliberately uh, to make the point that if we do these things right, i.e. the advanced systems and operations for the moon, that we get to use them again everywhere else we go that uh, there's no reason to, and I've, I'm a physicist, not an engineer, so I make apology to all engineers. Engineers like to design things that are optimized. Physicists look at fundamental principles. You know, within about 100% is fine. I mean, that's just within a factor of order of magnitude is about right. Uh, engineers like multiple decimals. We have a tendency uh, within the NASA family to want everything to be idealized and optimized for a particular application. <coughs> that means that you have one set of systems for Moon, another set of systems for LEO, you have a third set of systems for Mars, and they're all designed to be optimized for that specific purpose. Um, hearing about Rickover's nuclear navy a few minutes ago uh, reminded me that you don't build a nuclear submarine and its associated weaponry and train its crew to go to a particular destination at a particular time. They go everywhere, they go all the, whenever they have to go, and they do whatever they're told to do. We need to move in that general direction in terms of robust and sustainable operations in space. Similarly, large power systems delivering energy across the, the solar system, that'll be one of the topics we're talking about tomorrow. But, um, and how do we get there? Well, I want to just highlight uh, coming now to, so that's sort of the vision. The vision of advanced lunar operations, eventual settlement, development of the lunar resources, 
applying those capabilities across the, uh, uh, both the cis lunar space and in low Earth orbit, using them to go on to Mars and to destinations beyond. So that's the vision. But how can that, in fact, be realized? Well, in order to, to, to work, uh, human exploration and development, uh, the, the human exploration, development, and settlement has to be both affordable and sustainable. I, it cannot be like an Apollo program where you have an enormous surge of funding and then we abandon it. It's got to be something that we get started and that ultimately engenders substantial involvement of the U.S. economy uh, and allows us to engage the, the, uh, the global space community. I put this up just to highlight the point that you don't get to, uh, you, you, and you need, obviously, to be affordable and sustainable, it's got to be affordable, first and foremost. It's got to be safe and reliable, i.e., you can't have systems failing all the time or people dying all the time, just to say there aren't going to be risks, but, uh, and it's got to be both effective and extensible, i.e., you have to be able to accomplish missions that matter, and you've got to be able to take the tools that you build in the next 10 years and use them subsequently. Well, affordability, effectiveness, and reliability, safety don't just happen. You've actually got to plan for them, design for them, and develop the systems that make those things happen. So, for example, at the center of everything is you've got to have energy. You've got to be power and energy rich in future. And from being power and energy rich come things like being able to use local resources at the moon and at destinations beyond. From being power and energy rich, you have the opportunity to have high energy propulsion systems, which give you uh, the margins and redundancy and short trip times and so on, which lead to reliability and safety. Uh, having local resources engenders and helps out with lo in local uh, refueling and being able to do things uh, by being able to do refueling allows you to have system reusability, vehicle reusability, and so on and so on. So this basically it just uh, the, the purpose of this chart is, and of course I've left off, off most of the interrelationships, but the point is that an ecosystem, a technological ecosystem, doesn't just come from one object it com or one technology or one system. It comes from a well thought through strategic family of systems and capabilities uh, which synergistically make possible a completely new approach to space. So turning now back to the visions, uh, just, to, just to, to run through very quickly. So for example, advances in modular structures and in telerobotics and intelligent modular systems, i.e. our piece parts need to be, need to be at least as smart as a, uh, as a wristwatch is today, uh, you put those things together and suddenly you can have very large space systems like these ultra-large space telescopes that can grow and be locally maintained and have the potential for reconfiguration. You have advances and you have new technologies, for example, in nuclear propulsion, nuclear, in uh, nuclear power, solar power, advanced propulsion, wireless power, and all of a sudden you put those together and you have the capabilities for a variety of high energy space systems. The ability to handle regolith, uh, automated mining systems, the ability to use the extracted uh, ices and volatiles to make uh, propellants and to make uh, atmosphere constituents for human habitation, developing new life support, and all of a sudden you, have, you can have a, a sustainable lunar outpost and a robust capability for uh, local uh, industry on the lunar surface. You take uh, technologies like uh, electric propulsion and, uh, and very high power, high specific power solar, uh, along with uh, composite cryo tanks and zero boil off cryogenic storage. And all of a sudden you have uh, capabilities like uh, affordable in-space transportation freighters and uh, in-space propellant depots without which, without affordable, these aspects of affordable logistics, you don't have the option to have reusable uh, reuse of your expensive space transportation systems. Uh, and of course, intelligent modular systems in the, in the notebook, uh, John used the, uh, the, the term von Neumann machines. Uh, I, I prefer this one because it harkens a little bit more to the things that we have in all of our pockets. Um, 
uh, things like modular systems and robotics, uh, capabilities like autonomous rendezvous and docking, the, the right kinds of mechanisms and interconnections, and all of a sudden, large arrays of modular lunar surface systems, as well as any kind of large system like uh, uh, the case of the solar power satellite there beaming power down to Mars, those things become possible because you're able to assemble the things that you need in space uh, from piece parts that are common, more or less like uh, Legos. It's, uh, every child knows how to take a box of Legos and, and, and start playing with it. It's intuitive. Uh, you don't need it to have a, 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 a graduate degree in rocket science. So what are the cornerstones for making this kind of thing happen? If we look at the history, the, the last uh, uh, 60 years, you see uh, the, what I'm describing as the, the, the Gen 1 of space. The cornerstones were things like expendable launch vehicles, ICBMs, uh, the Deep Space Network, Apollo and Saturn uh, systems, geostationary commsats, uh, the creation of launch ranges and related infrastructures, uh, Earth observing, planetary spacecraft, all of that happened in less than a generation. Sort of Gen 2, uh, things like the global positioning system, the space shuttle, uh, TDRS, the tracking and data relay satellite system uh, up in GEO, uh, very long baseline interferometry that opened the radio uh, as part of the spectrum of the universe to humanity, uh, synthetic aperture radars, the first space station, and so on. All in that next generation. And then the third generation, things like next generation GPS that, you know, all of us have the ability on our mobile phones to suddenly access GPS. That's a profound advancement, uh, which we, we just completely take for granted. Uh, great advances in DOD and so on, the International Space Station, Iridium, all of the, the Mars rovers and so on in that third cycle. The top 10, I, I would argue here, are things, really profound cornerstones, where things like GPS, uh, things like uh, uh, space-based communication satellites, launch ranges, Saturn, Apollo, i.e. that all of those technologies, um, um, the space shuttle and the International Space Station I lumped together, and the Deep Space Network, which as, an architect, which as an infrastructure makes possible communications out to the edge of our solar system and beyond, and all the science and exploration that comes with that. Those are kind of my top 10. And most of those all came into fruition two or three generations ago. And so what are the transformations that, and I would, I would argue you know, there's nothing wrong with the next generation of GPS, but it's not nearly as profound as actually creating Earth orbiting satellites and Earth orbiting communication satellites or the first GPS and so on. So I would argue that one of the things that we're looking at this morning and over the next several days is this question of what are the cornerstones that will make possible an ambitious vision for affordable and sustainable human exploration, development, and settlement of space. And I believe it will be, and that we, will, we can fill into this box up here in the, the upper left-hand corner, we can fill into this box the cornerstone systems and infrastructures that make possible energy-rich operations. Um, just as an aside, I, I, I'll digress for just a moment. Um, the, the, most, the largest, highest power uh, space power system, obviously, that's ever been flown uh, is the International Space Station with a steady capacity of about 100 kilowatts, which is about as much power as a, as a neighborhood of a half a dozen homes has, is wired for. And the cost per kilowatt hour up there on the space station is something like $50 a kilowatt hour. And if you compare that to the power in your home, the power generated uh, by the Tennessee Valley Authority generations ago, uh, it's, it's a, m many, many orders of magnitude less power and several orders of magnitude more expensive. So we're not going to do any of those ambitious things without becoming energy rich. And that energy has to cost a lot less than energy in space today. 
direct, directly derivative, very high energy, high uh, efficiency, high thrust propulsion than what we can do today with uh, conventional chemical rockets. Have to be able to do in space local refueling. Uh, need modular self-assembling uh, systems to get to very large systems. <coughs> Once you have these things, you also need reusable space systems. Uh, you need to be able to extract and process resources locally. Uh, and you need to be, have uh, the capability for locally self-sufficient human habitation. It's fundamentally critical. Um, I understand the hook. Thank you. Um, oh, no, not, not now. Now you offer it to me. <clears throat> I switched into my basso. <laughs> um, another another uh, sort of, you know, if you, look at the, if you look at the life support systems and resupply and so on, the requirements for a half a dozen people on the International Space Station, it's a fabulous achievement. But the only reason it works is because uh, you ha the Earth is only 300 kilometers away or 300 miles away. If we go to the moon, uh, several things happen. One, you cannot constantly bring up uh, replacement water and, and so on. Two, you can't just take your trash and t toss it out the airlock. It's not going anywhere. It's just going to sit outside the door. All of that has to be recycled so that your habitation systems become increasingly, if not completely self-sufficient. And obviously, they'll never be completely self-sufficient. No community on Earth is completely self-sufficient. They all work in the, in the context of a larger ecosystem and, and economy. But they have, we have to move in that direct, direction and by orders of magnitude in order for this, this vision to be true. So in conclusion, a few cornerstone systems and infrastructures, things like expendable launch vehicles, things like uh, the Deep Space Network and so on, completely enabled our, uh, the experience, the, the life that we've all lived. They made possible uh, what was uh, described uh, in the 60s as the space age. And although we take it for granted today, and we talk about you know, this IT and all these other things, the information age, we are in fact still living in the space age that was made possible by the cornerstones that were developed during that first generation of innovation. Now there is the opportunity, and in fact, if we are going to maintain global leadership, the requirement that we identify and we pursue uh, the new cornerstones, which working together synergistically can do the same thing for the 21st century. If we do this, and we do it right, and we pursue these new cornerstones, we, get, we will, one, we will establish continued U.S. leadership in humanity's uh, expansion into space, and in particular, during our lifetimes, expansion to the moon. If you look at the list, this swarm of missions that are all going to the moon, from, from as I said, from India, from Japan, from China, uh, from new space companies, it's quite remarkable. This is, uh, this, this is uh, it has, has no comparison to you know, the small and occasional startup activities that got going that had to do with, say, for example, a mission to an asteroid like uh, Deep Space Industries or, or Planetary Resources, as admirable as those firms are. Um, it has nothing like the uh, activities of uh, inter international space agencies and so on going to Mars. And so it's, it is really astonishing. And um, the U.S. is not playing a leadership role at this time. We're going to get there, but not quite yet. And if we do this, it will then enable, uh, by that I mean the cornerstones, the exploration and the development of the solar system beyond, and rather than just going with the occasional flag and footprint. So thank you very much.